There's a lot of evidence that multiple sclerosis disease modifying therapies work in the short run, but a lot of clinical trials are only two years and some people are skeptical that they may not be effective in the long run. Let's hear from multiple sclerosis researcher, Professor George Ebers. I know lots of things that, uh, you know, you'd have to take some anti-nauseants after because it's so distasteful. This is from the documentary Living Proof, directed by Matt Embry, and I did a separate review of this documentary if you want to take a look. Ebers goes on to criticize the methodology and the ethics of the pharmaceutical companies. I fell out of, uh, out of sync with things when I couldn't get the pharmaceutical industry to do the studies that were really needed, which is looking at long-term outcomes, where you reached a point where something really important was happening, like the development of progressive disease. We, we, we couldn't get them to do it. I mean, I can tell you that, you know, a couple of them told me, frankly, like, why would we do this? We're, we're selling lots of drug. We're making lots of money. But doing that study can only be bad for us. If it shows that, that it does work, then we'll be right where we are right now. If we show that it doesn't work, we've lost the whole ball game. There's almost no evidence that, 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 that any of these drugs make a difference in the long term. What they do very cleverly is leave the impression that it's going to make a difference in the long run without actually saying so. The, 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 that's where the controversy began because when pressure was put on them 20, 25 years ago to carry out the studies and make them longer and reach harder outcomes, let's say time to... Um, needing a cane to walk, the Food and Drug Administration were the only ones that had the power to enforce this. All they had to do was say, okay, you don't get the long-term outcome, no approval. And there's nothing more motivating from a pharmaceutical company than to tell them they're going to have their license for the drug jerked if they don't comply. They never did it. The director of the documentary, Matt Embry, claims to have had multiple sclerosis for over 20 years with no symptoms despite not taking disease-modifying therapies, and he is a proponent of the MS Hope Diet, which is essentially a paleo, low-saturated fat diet. Here are some of his thoughts on the drugs. People accuse me of being anti-against pharmaceuticals, but this is not true. If there was a drug that conventionally demonstrates a significantly slow long-term progression, I would probably take it but I haven't seen it. I wonder why MS patients are injecting or swallowing MS drugs that may cause serious side effects or even death, but have not been proven to be effective in the long run. And why do taxpayers around the globe pay billions of dollars for MS drugs that have been demonstrated to have no long-term effect? However, in my review of the documentary, I disagreed with this and claimed that there is evidence for long-term efficacy of disease-modifying therapies in MS. And in this video, I'm going to show you some of the evidence behind my position. And of course, the sources will be included below. And at the end, please comment, do you agree with my argument or do you side with Embry and Ebers and why? Let's have some fun. So to give a conflict of interest statement, although I don't have any specific financial conflict, I am a traditionally trained doctor and I do prescribe many of these medications. Whether or not I'm brainwashed by the pharmaceutical companies, you be the judge. I am cherry picking the data a little bit just to make a point. It certainly is possible to find long-term studies that may tell a little bit of a different story. But I'll try to be as fair as possible. And I'm not necessarily against the MS Hope Diet. You can certainly check out some of my videos on nutrition, such as on dairy and saturated fat. By the way, I'm Brandon Bieber. I make videos about multiple sclerosis every Wednesday, so please subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. I'd like to give a special thanks to Dr. Rosa Lucetta for compiling this excellent review of long-term studies in multiple sclerosis. And so I used a lot of the studies from her review article. I'll certainly post it in the notes below. This is a study on multiple sclerosis in the so-called treatment era at University of California, San Francisco. And what you're looking at is the time to reach EDSS-6. 
EDSS, or Expanded Disability Status Scale, is a score measuring disability in multiple sclerosis. And I have a separate video on this topic if you want to take a look. But basically, EDSS 6 is the level of disability where a cane is required to walk 100 meters. And what I'm going to show is that the overall prognosis in multiple sclerosis seems to be getting somewhat better. Now, there could be many reasons for that, only one of which is the use of disease-modifying therapies. We could be getting better at diagnosing milder multiple sclerosis. Maybe more people are taking multiple sclerosis supplements, such as vitamin D. It's not exactly known, but there is very strong evidence that MS is becoming milder, at least on the average. And you can see after 10 years, only 4.7% of people are actually reaching EDSS of 6. And after 20 years, only 16.2%. And after 25 years, which you'll see is important in just a moment, maybe about 30% are requiring a cane or more. Now let's go back to 1983. This is a cross-sectional study from the famous Queen Square data set. And you can see that adjusting for expected MS mortality after 25 years or more, about 66% had severe disability, defined as an EDSS of six or more. So roughly 30% versus 66%, the number requiring a cane seems to have more than doubled. Now, it's not exactly a fair comparison because this is cross-sectional data and not longitudinal data, but even if you look back to 6 and 15 years, and even if you look at the unadjusted numbers, not accounting for mortality, you're still seeing about 30%. So the level of disability that was typical at 6 to 15 years is now more typical at around 25 years. So pretty significant difference there. The same thing is true if you look at transition to secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. Also from UCSF, you can see the percentage of people who went from relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis to secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. And after 10 years, only about 6.4% had progressive MS. After 20 years, about 24.2%. Although after 40 years, it's more than half, but still this is much, much less than historical studies. Now, if you look at some cross-sectional studies, this is data from Sweden comparing 1995 and 2010. Only a 15-year difference, and this is actually within the treatment era because beta seron was FDA-approved in 1993, and many of the newer FDA-approved drugs are since 2010. And still, you can see in 2010, there's a lower probability of reaching every level of disability. So EDSS3, mild disability, EDSS4, moderate disability, or EDSS6, requiring a cane, you can see the odds ratio is less than one comparing 2010 to 1995. Now, there's also a slight trend towards people who are treated earlier in the disease having a lower probability of reaching that level of disability. This is data from Brazil showing that people who were treated earlier have a lower probability of reaching secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. If you were treated prior to reaching EDSS3, in other words, while you still had a low level of disability, it took on average 39 years to develop progressive MS. Whereas if you were not treated prior to reaching EDSS3, it was actually 21 years. Now this is a little bit biased potentially because some people are not diagnosed until they already have an EDSS of three or more. And of course, this isn't the best way to study the issue. It's certainly not a randomized trial and many other factors could be at play, but that's certainly a very significant difference, 18 year difference in the average time to reach a uh, secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. Sclerosis. Now let's look at some individual drugs. Now, of course, we cannot do long-term randomized trials. It's unethical to keep someone blinded for their treatment for many, many years. And of course, it's unethical to keep someone on a placebo after the treatment has already been proven to be effective and to not tell people what they were getting. So a lot of these clinical trials are only randomized and blinded for two years. And you can see in the original Tysabri studies, after two years, there was a difference in the average EDSS between the treatment and the placebo. So the placebo group have an average EDSS of 2.69 compared to 2.36 after two years. So only a 0.33 difference in the EDS scale, but this is after only two years. Now, what about STRATA, the long-term follow-up study up to 240 weeks? You can see that even after many years, that difference is sustained. In other words, the placebo group never catches up, ever at least as far as we've studied this. Although there was only a 58% who followed the entire 240 weeks, so there could be a bias due to selective dropout. 
let's look at the effectiveness study on Tysabri, the top study. This is people who were continuously studied with Tysabri, who continuously took Tysabri for 10 years. And you can see the cumulative probability of disability worsening was about 27.8% over 10 years. But the cumulative probability of improving was 33.1%. So you were more likely to have improved than to have worsened. Now, unfortunately, some people did significantly worsen. And that's why, on average, people still were a little bit worse. Average median EDSS of 3.5 compared to 4.0 10 years later, although a difference of 0.5 over 10 years is not that much. Now, this is purely based on a press release, and this is from the company that makes Ocrevus, so take it with a grain of salt. I do have a separate video on this specific topic if you want to take a look. I still await the publication. But this is based on a post hoc analysis of six year follow up data from the phase three trials of Ocrevus versus Rebif, the OPERA study. I actually participated in this trial and recruited some patients. And they found that for people who are randomized to Ocrevus, a high efficacy agent, after six years, only 4.3% were using a cane or reached an EDSS of 6 compared to 7.2% who were randomized to Rebif beta interferon 1A, a low efficacy treatment. So the people who received a high efficacy treatment definitely did better. Now in absolute terms, it's only about a 3% difference, but in terms of relative terms, there's about a half or 49% lower probability of requiring a cane. This is exactly what Dr. Ebers was asking for. Here it is, Dr. Ebers. Ocrevus was also linked to slowed thalamic volume loss. The thalamus is a sensory area of the brain involved in relaying various circuits. This is the long-term study looking at various different trials with Gelenia or Fingolimod. I have a separate video on Fingolimod if you want to learn more about this medication. This is a 14-year study, although it's a lot of different studies, so not all of the individuals recruited for these trials were taking Julenia for the entire 14 years, but you can see the percentage of people who had confirmed disability progression was very low, only about 60% even after 14 years, so a lot of people were very stable. And if you look at the probability of having relapses, it seems that fingolimod may become more effective at preventing relapses over time. So about 20% had at least one relapse in the first year, but after 10 years, less than 1% had relapses. Now, of course, there's a tendency for people to drop out and stop taking Gelenia if it's not working for them. And also, as people get older, the risk of relapses does decline. So the real effect is not this dramatic, but it is something to note. Also, if you look at the probability of reaching a certain level of disability, it's fairly impressive compared to historical controls. For instance, if you look at EDSS4, EDSS6 requiring a cane, or EDSS7 more advanced disability, after 10 years, only 68% were less than an EDSS of 4, and 85% were less than an EDSS of 6. So the average age at enrollment was 38, and the average time of symptoms at the time of enrollment was 18.7 years. So you figure after 10 years, on average, they're 48 years old and had had MS for on average 18.7 years, and still about two-thirds had an EDSS of less than 4, and only 15% were using a cane. Not too bad. What about lower efficacy agents? Well, this is the ENDORSE study, the follow-up of Tecfidera. And even though this medication isn't necessarily considered super high efficacy, people seem to do relatively well on it if they're on it over long periods of time. Now, again, there's some biases because when people fail medications, they tend to drop out. And so these are the people who stayed on the medication. But it seems that it becomes more effective at preventing relapses over time. And after 10 years, the rate of relapses was only 0.057. In other words, only one relapse maybe every 18 years or so. The average age was 41, and after 10 years, 51% were relapse-free, and 64% had no signs of confirmed disability progression. And again, if we look at data reaching a certain EDSS score, this is the percentage of people who had an EDSS of 3.5 or less, in other words, mild or moderate or no disability. And even after 10 years, 79% were less than or equal to 3.5 on the scale, which is pretty impressive. 
Now, what about a group of individuals who were higher risk? This is the Lentrata study, and these people had higher disease activity compared to, say, the Tecfidera patients when entered into the study. This is the Topaz study looking at an eight-year follow-up. And even after eight years, this relatively high-risk group, 40% had worsened, but 25% had actually improved, and 35% remained the same. So even in this high-risk group, most people were the same or even better, which is somewhat impressive. Now, this is a study that's been highly criticized. This is the 16-year beta serum follow-up, and Dr. Evers has criticized this specific study, and I do agree with him. However, it's interesting that those who were randomized to placebo rather than beta interferon were actually more likely to pass away. 20 out of 123, or 16.3%, had actually died after 16 years, compared to only 4.8%, 6 out of 124, who were randomized to the higher dose of beta serum. This is highly statistically significant, but there was very poor follow-up, and there are a lot of biases on this study, so I would take it with a grain of salt. What about a very high efficacy treatment, such as hematopoietic stem cell transplant? I have a specific video on hematopoietic stem cell transplant in multiple sclerosis, if you want to take a look. This is a study done in Canada on 25 individuals treated with busulfan-based hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Now, busulfan is very toxic. One of the 25 individuals in the study did, unfortunately, die of infection, so there is some risk here. However, even after 12, 120 months, 10 years, the rate of brain atrophy had reduced to comparable to normal aging. And so unfortunately, the brain is shrinking in multiple sclerosis somewhat more than it is with normal aging, but hematopoietic stem cell transplant seems to stop that. There's an initial increase in atrophy due to the cytotoxic nature of these medications. This is another, another hematopoietic stem cell transplant study done in Sweden in aggressive relapsing multiple sclerosis. They used beam and antithymocyte globulin, cytoxan antithymocyte, Thymocyte globulin. Again, click on that video if you want to learn more about the conditioning regimens. But even after 110 months or 11 years, uh, almost 80% were free of disability progression. Very impressive. So to summarize, we know that multiple sclerosis is becoming somewhat milder over time and seems to have a better prognosis. This could be due to disease-modifying therapy use, although certainly there could be other factors. In particular, we may be better at diagnosing milder multiple sclerosis. However, the extension studies of randomized trials, such as the Strata dataset, show that people who are randomized to placebo still have greater disability even many years after the trial is done. So even the initial two years of treatment with placebo seems to cause a long-term problem. Also, long-term studies of various disease-modifying therapies, and of course I showed many examples, seem to suggest that the rate of relapses and the rate of disability progression is lower than what you would expect. Now that being said, there are no clinical trials that maintain randomization and blinding for many, many years. Of course, there are ethical questions, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video. So are you convinced by the evidence that I provided? Do these medications work in the long term, or do you side with Ebers? Let me know in the comments, and if you have any questions or requests for future videos, please post in the comments below.